Hey guys, welcome back to more Last of Part 2 Remaster. In this video, I want to check out the lost levels that was added in the remastered version of this game. I want to make my $10 worth. So, we're starting out with the first one, Jackson Party. There's somewhere here. Oh, look at that. Developer commentary and introduction video. I mean, it was on by default, so I kind of feel like I should leave it on. But I'm not sure how much commentary there is in this. There's probably going to be like little bubbles. Or like when you get to a certain part in the level. I'm not sure if it's going to be the constant talking. So if it's constant talking. Like this part's interesting. Because these this first level here. It says there's no spoken dialogue. So it would be kind of nice to hear something from anybody in this game. Let's try it out. This is actually the most interesting part of the remastered. Because uh. There are levels that were not added, they were cut out, and I want to hear the reason why. You're about to play an unfinished level from The Last of Us Part 2. The reason we added this section is there are a few sequences, and we picked the three of the best ones, that we cut from the game. You know, often we build a game that's much bigger than what ends up being the final product. There are months away from being finished, but we wanted to give you an insight of what it's like when we built a game, because often we have this whole thing constructed and it doesn't have final art or audio or dialogue. And here you get to see the building blocks of what it's like when we first string a bunch of these levels together. This is the intro to the first deleted level, and this one is the roughest of the three. We wanted to show more of how Jackson operates. So this is the festival where Ellie ultimately kisses Dina. This sequence would have come very late in the game as a flashback sequence while you're in the farm with Dina. And we wanted to show what is the rest of Jackson doing um, and wanted to put on the stick, make it interactive. So you could see when you're outside, there are all these almost like carnival games that you can play. You could mix drinks, you could play with these kids that are playing a sort of clicker Marco Polo, sit down and listen to conversations. And all the different interactions were first or second pass, very, very early passes. The building blocks are there, but nothing is final. And ultimately, while we were very excited by the sequence, it's pretty fun and lighthearted. It just slowed things too much as we're barreling towards the end of the story at this point. So again, reminder, rough, missing audio, missing animation, missing gameplay tweaks, missing dialogue, but pretty representative of what it would have been. So enjoy. I will enjoy it. This is it. Okay, there's a dialogue. The missing dialogue in the subtitles. There's Ellie drinking beer, getting turned to F up. Ah. Psst, breaks the bottle down. Is it broken? And it's gone. Is this a commentary from the developer? Originally. This level was going to transition us to farm. We would go all the way through to the dance where Ellie and Dina share their first kiss. Then we would play through farm and when Ellie plays the guitar at night, she would remember the Seth incident. So, the opening for this was a little tricky. We needed it to match at least a little what you might expect emotionally coming from prior beats because we were already purposefully disorienting you in time and space. Remember, you just came from this huge fight. To jump straight into it, would have been a little too jarring. After some back and forth, we rooted it in Ellie's nerves, calling back to her hands shaking in the theater. But this time, for a much more innocuous reason, we'll find out later. She's nervous because she has a crush on Dina, who is the only reason why she's here at the dance. Right, so the first lost level is about going to the, the Jackson party. Because we actually play the game, it's like big cutscenes back to back, sort of. So. Instead of that, the original idea, I guess, was to play a little bit and then to play the next cutscene, which would be the part itself. Something we really wanted to do was highlight the way their lives had turned upside down since she went down this path. We had this idea of recontextualizing all of our usual gameplay mechanics that were designed for really violent ends. The workbench, door bashes, throwable weapons, and even the infected, which is my personal favorite. Peppered throughout the level are moments of levity or shared history, all the while seeing how happy and mundane they all were before her huge revenge odyssey. Okay, so I hear kids. I wonder if all dialogue was cut out, or maybe only some, 
weren't able to make it to the final game. Oh, I can play a game. Nice. Nice try, Ellie. Shut up. This game is rigged anyway. <laughs> ah, nice dialogue. It is not a festival without one of these throwing games. This one, of course, uses our throwable system where you're often chucking explosive things or stunning things, but for a more wholesome purpose. Although some people take this game really seriously. A fun aspect of this is if you did well, you could win a toy here. Ellie would place it in her pocket. If you had done this, you'd find the toy with JJ, the baby, later back at the farm. When we cut this, the toy made it through anyway because it was so cute. It is the same one you see on the tractor at the farm. Ollie the elephant. Oh, nice fun fact. Something that we none of us knew about until they released this lost level. What's this? Some sort of drinking game? We use our workbench a lot to make a lot of things that kill and maim and hurt people. Here, we had the silly idea of using the same feel, harkening back to the same animations, using the exact same UI to instead fix a drink. Like the workbench, you could pick your base and then you could add something to it. And at the time, we had some different reactions from Ellie based on how strong you chose to make the drink. Something we wanted to prototype though, before it got cut, was picking up some ingredients around to add like a lime or maybe a bottle of someone's favorite whiskey or salt, like you were earning upgrades. We also toyed with having Ellie carry around the drink you made and occasionally sip it, psyching herself up to go talk to Dina inside because she's nervous. It got too noodly though, because she would need to keep placing it somewhere before she did anything. So it would have ended up more trouble than it was worth. Yeah, you know, the whole drinking thing and mixing stuff and going around and grabbing more ingredients for the drink, I feel like that would have been a little bit too much because this section is already small enough and it's pretty, I don't know, just adding too much would have not been a good idea, which is, a, I guess, is the reason why they removed the entire thing in general. Also, Neil did mention that, I guess, this part uh, was making it too slow. So, um, that's pretty much their main reason why they cut it out. And I can see why going through this. Press X to start your swing, then press X to... I said X. Why didn't I say... <laughs> press square to start your swing. Oh, I was supposed to press... I was supposed to press it again. Hold on, can I do it again? I did it wrong. Let me do it again. Nuts! I can't do it again. Gotta restart the level. This is one of my favorite sections because I think that it achieves both the slice of life aspect of Jackson while also being a stark reminder of how dark the world that they live in really, really is. To attract attention and curiosity, one of the kids was supposed to make this adorable, messed up little clicker impression and the others would giggle. We tried a version where if you got close enough, the kid might try to follow you a little before turning back. Since clickers are blind and move by echolocation, for this game of messed up tag, Ellie must close her eyes and listen for when the children give themselves away. The thought was that these kids are in relative safety. They still grow up with the dangers of clickers and runners, and all those lessons would embed themselves in the games that they play. When the festival got cut, they tried to preserve this moment and move it to the front of the game where the snowball fight is, as a tutorial. However, being in the headspace of a clicker doesn't really teach you how to deal with them. Eventually, it evolved, and they instead made the snowball fight, which was, I think, way more effective. For me, it's character illuminating that not only does Ellie know this game, she plays along. There's a familiarity with the kids that's really nice to see, especially because it's such a difference from the Ellie we see later, who has a sort of hollow normalcy that she's trying to get with JJ, but kind of fails. Yeah, okay. Interesting little mini game there, acting like a clicker. Kind of cute, but also really weird because the animations with did with Ellie. I'm pretty sure they got the mocap directly from the person who does the mocap for the clickers.
Hitting them board. Let's get back up. Hey, guys. Welcome. A bunch of default NPCs. Okay, what's next? I feel the last bubble right there. There's a hidden spot at the back that was just a bit of fun. It was highlighting Jackson's normalcy with something we would find in a real world. In the back, you would find teenagers finding some alone time with each other in a dark corner of a party. It was rewarding the player for peeking into a hidden corner, but ultimately redirecting them back to the festival. We also had versions of them smoking weed here, despite Maria's consternation, probably having gotten it from Eugene. All right, that was all the bubbles. Now let's go to the actual party. And I'm pretty sure that's where it might end. Unless maybe there's more stuff to do inside. Doubt it, because I got all the bubbles. Yo, Maria. All right, that was the end of Jackson Party Lost Level. Next up is Seattle Sewers. Now, interesting enough, Seattle Sewers and The Hunt does not include the text in their bottom where it says the level does not have spoken dialogue, only plays all the lines shown as subtitles, which means, does someone talk? Does Ali talk? Let's hope and find out. Maybe it's like little like lines like grunts or sighs. In this second deleted level, which is an extended sequence of the sewers in Seattle, this comes on the heels of where Ellie goes into a building and she um, survives an attack by stalkers and gets thrown out of the window and gets swept away by the current. And then we cut the section that um, used to be there in the final game. Now you will get to play it. So this was a way to get a bit more interesting puzzles, um, interesting traversal, uh, figure out how Ellie can navigate the sewers with the fighting current. Ultimately, with a lot of these levels and these sequences, the reason why we cut them were for pacing purposes. Uh, but here it is for you in this very kind of raw form that part of it will feel finished, parts of it will feel like assets are missing as far as audio animation won't be final. But it's a glimpse into what a game looks like when it's months away from finishing. Enjoy. Here we go, last level. Fighting the current. Rough start, but I like it. A sewer oh, level would have been nice. Yeah, fuck Seattle. Okay. Where the hell am I? Well, clearly you're in the sewers. This level, internally known as Fine Nora, was quite long in duration as we had to make Ellie traverse a far distance to the opposite side of downtown Seattle. The sewer <gasps> section was originally longer than what we released the game with, approximately <gasps> 10 minutes more. This was one of the few areas of the game that used water flow as part of a traversal puzzle. The player has to go upstream to use the current to get to the platform to reach the other side. We mostly cut this mechanic game wide, however it remained what in essence in the section swimming to the aquarium as Ellie when you were avoiding the waves. There's crafting. Are there going to be enemies here? 
Or maybe just left over. If it's left over, they probably could have just turned that off. If you're not going to use any of the crafting utilities. We're going to make just for fun. I got a bomb and a medkit on me. And some arrows. When players reach the doorway and enter into the room, they're faced with a dead end. The real reason for this dead end room is that on the reversal when exiting back out of the doorway, <gasps> players are faced with a route onwards. A pipe that they've not been able to see when they were swept past it on the way in, and something that was hidden from view when on the side platforms. The intention here being that the only option is to go off the standard path in order to search for a way out. Okay, going there goes nowhere, so I have to go on that pipe. Wait a minute, hold on. What's that bubble? The ladder acts as an immediate goal for the player, but being able to climb out is not going to be so easy. To keep levels interesting and engaging, we alternate between positive and negative values the player experiences. Here, it's a positive to have found a ladder, but then a negative to discover it's not the solution. But then another positive to identify the next short-term goal of the doorway. By alternating between these opposing values, we give players what they expect, but not how they expect it. I just go this way and try to jump on that pipe. This little narrow thing. <gasps> Made it. What's that? Cloth. Uh, get me the hell out of here. <sighs> Throughout the rest of the level, we also use light to indicate to the player that they were heading in the right direction. At each turn, however, we block the direct route forward. Players would know that they just have to keep finding alternative paths, promoting those feelings of being desperate and trapped. Wow, there's 15 bubbles. That's a lot. We slowly introduce the player to consider climbing into smaller pipes and crouching in these tight spaces. Up this is to slowly build up to and encourage keep going up and the out. player to climb into such a small pipe that they'd have to be crawling on their stomach, which is something that the player previously may not have recognized as a playable space let alone the desired route they need to take. We added a tiny space just to reward the player's exploration with a pickup item, and we made sure it was something that made sense that you'd find in this area. A canister and all the garbage that had been washed into the sewers from the surface. Yeah, would have been funny finding bulls down here. A nice, healthy, fresh, clean box of bullets for my shotgun. How nice of them to drop, throw it away down here in the sewer for no reason. Hilarious. Or like flaming arrows. Or not flaming, but um, those pre-made explosive arrows would have been really funny to find down here. We love the idea of making Ellie prone through a tiny, dirty pipe in order to get out. Okay. As it was a great opportunity to use oh, our frame mechanic. Shit, the unique camera setup was created to support crawling in these pipes, as the standard prone camera is much higher above the player. We also created custom collision in order for Ellie to maneuver in these tight spaces easily. Initially, the oblong collision capsule around her character caused issues crawling around corners. But we put extra effort into the custom corner collision so the movement experience is as smooth as the main game. Nice. In order for the player to feel cramped, claustrophobic, and desperate, we'd been enforcing the traversal mechanics that allow for a tight environment which promote these feelings. We introduced the use of the squeeze through so that we can keep the player feeling enclosed and tight, but without repeating the same geometry. Here, we changed from low ceilings with wider walls to high ceilings and tight walls to change up the spatial pacing and keep the level from repeating itself. Man, Ellie was super mad at this point. Just having to deal with stalkers and then just falling down the rapid waters towards the sewers. Can I understand that? Originally, we had the water line much higher here, so players had to swim through this tight tunnel. However, from watching user test feedback, it was occasionally causing people to discount the route entirely and turn back on themselves. So to avoid any risk of this happening in the final game, we present a lower water level so the tunnel is easy to see and commit to using. Although this isn't as impactful without the prone swim, it's the better decision as it means a smooth experience for the player with no backtracking frustration. As we surface from the water and over the crest of the slope, we reveal what is further in this tunnel a clicker that has sprouted and the fungus has grown on the sides of the pipe. 
It was great to see people who use the test in this area becoming increasingly worried as we forced the player to squeeze past the fungus and inches away from the clicker's face, all the time not being sure whether the clicker might be alive or attack them. Although we aren't as cruel as to force a clicker attack in such close proximity, we do have a payoff for this moment. This clicker momentarily turned into Joel to show Ellie's PTSD from what happened to Joel at the start of the game. Ultimately, we decided to save this moment for the farm level, as it was more impactful there because it could become the centerpiece of that experience. Whereas in the sewers, we weren't able to make it as much of a narrative point and give it the breathing room and reaction time that it deserves, given the tight space. Did the commentator just spoil what's going to happen right now? There's the clicker. And you mentioned a PTSD moment. That's crazy. Definitely would have been a lot more impactful without the commentary. Sorry about that. I didn't know they were about to spoil it. Ah, oh shit. <laughs> okay, where's your next? Am I supposed to climb up on a pipe somewhere? There it is. Hold on, wait. This is the uh, the original section that wasn't cut off. Okay, I see. So the original game, you just slide into this area, but um, what was cut out was the uh, section that just passed, which is where you were originally supposed to slide into. Honestly, not a big cut. I thought it would be like an entire whole system of sewers with tunnels and stuff where like it'd be amazing, you'd probably get lost. But um, no, it was not that big at all. Using this pipe was retained in the iteration we shipped with, as it's the last of the extreme methods Ellie has to undergo in order to escape the sewers and what she will go through in her pursuit of revenge. <laughs> The last ladder climb is quite lengthy, and although we could have trimmed it down to a shorter climb, we liked how this last segment of the journey built anticipation for whether there was success at the top or not after all you've been through. Ultimately, the ladder exits out into the subway station, which is how it connects in the final game. Ellie then has to find her way to the hospital from here, crossing paths with the scars for the first time. That's pretty cool. That was Seattle's sewers. Now, the last one, the hunt. For this third and final deleted level, um, what we called the boar hunt sequence, this was a sequence pretty late in the game. It was right after the whole Seattle Abby sequence where uh, Abby spares Ellie. And then we wanted to come back into Ellie's story, but keep it a bit mysterious of how much time has passed, where is Ellie now? So we're coming in on Ellie uh, and she's following a trail of blood. And we wanted to mirror in a way the deer hunt sequence from the first game, but this time do it with a boar. And there's something with Ellie that now she's she can't let go of this violence. She's pursuing it, um, even against this innocent animal. This was another opportunity to show how the violence that Ellie has experienced, the violence that she witnessed being uh, afflicted onto Joel, is still sticking with her. And she's still uh, experiencing these PTSD moments. This was a sequence that was pretty far along and was cut pretty late in production. Parts of it are still really rough, but the gameplay, the building blocks were all there. I think you'll have fun to see, like, a, again, a rough, unfinished sequence um, of the, that you can play. You can see all the way to the end, and including a cinematic that we end up cutting. 
and the remnants of the sequence ended up being mentioned in Ellie's journal. So this part of the, the story that we developed still made its way into the game as kind of optional stuff that you could read about, but here you get to experience it. So as a reminder, this is pretty rough, months away from being finished, uh, but you get to see it now. Just now, as he was talking about it, I had to look at my phone because he mentioned a deer hunt sequence in the first Where game. And I was thinking you? to myself, what deer hunt sequence? And when I looked it up, I remembered, like, oh, yeah, when you play as Ellie for the first time in The Last of Us 1, you go hunt for a deer. Because whenever, whenever I think about that part with the hunting, I always think about that one little part with the bunny, and that's it. I just forget that there's a deer in that section as well. So the boar hunt was one of the hardest levels for me to work on. It was a huge challenge with the systems that we had, and we kept trying, but it never felt quite right. Originally, the level happened after the Jackson Festival, which also got cut, but before Farm. Once the festival got cut, it became the prologue to Farm. The intended experience is that we jump forward in time after the fight with Abby in the theater. We don't know where Dina is. We likely assume she's dead because she was just bleeding out. Ellie is alone, her hair is short, so maybe this is the future or the present. And she's hunting. Hunting who? Abby still? So this place after the Jackson party flashback. Yeah, honestly, they put a lot of gameplay in this section. This, like, the ending part before the farm. Which uh, would have been cool to see, I guess, if there was all put in. But at the same time, I understand why they would call this out. Because it was being too lengthy and you're getting to like the the last part of the game which has like a lot of gameplay anyways so you know just leaving to a bunch of cutscenes and then the farm and then more cutscenes there nothing wrong just it's fine the way they did it in early iterations of the fight it was more arena like the player slowly whittles down the boar's health ellie gets more visceral and more vicious we get a little worried about her as the boar gets weaker more panicked more feral and we start feeling sympathetic to the boar was the hope uh, in all of these iterations, especially of these wider areas, it required custom AI and scripting to make sure it continued to feel organic as an animal, but we really needed it to do specific stuff. It needed to be able to close distances really, really quickly. It needed to charge to attack, but we wanted the feeling of hunting, so we needed to track it down from afar. And we also needed to discourage the player from attacking the boar when it's that close, or it would kind of turn into this melee kerfuffle. How do we do this in our world while keeping the boar believable? We must have gone through five or six iterations of the boar fight and all, and every single time it changed pretty gotcha. drastically. We split it into clear phases where one was like all long range. We tried another where you're getting close and you get the jump on it quite literally. You're jumping off of a rock <laughs> to attack it. Uh, and then finally, we tried a bunch where you almost so, sort of uh, go around a bunch of trailers and try and try and wrestle it. We uncovered after some time that taking down a boar over several phases felt very laborious and a little dramatic. It was comically long. It felt too boss-like, uh, a little too gamey. We decided to cut the first few phases, and we opted for a cold open after the boar had already been hurt off screen. So that allowed us to focus on feeling like we're closing in on prey and to introduce the boar when it was at its most dangerous. Already hurt, already feral, much too close for comfort. And so the thinking was it would bring us more into Ellie's mindset. Is this really hunting for food or is she hunting for some other reason? Probably mad. The gas station was built to highlight the boar's destructiveness. Since it's cramped, the boar feels larger. We also feel trapped with it, though perhaps it's trapped with us. When it charges, it gets to us quickly, so we must be on our toes. This made it more aligned with Ellie's sort of hunting for trouble mindset. Listening became more important, as well as moving around slowly so it didn't hear you. Could you spot it before it saw or heard you? And could you get a shot off quickly enough so you could dodge out of the way? Or is the shot worth the cost after? It feels like a gamble. By the end of the fight, everything would likely be in shambles. The boar would burst through the back, and Ellie would follow it and finally enact revenge. So I gotta shoot here and kill it. Oh! 
Got you. Got you. So uh, what happens when I run out of bullets and I don't kill it yet? Do I just gotta stab it to death? The whole melee kerfuffle? I totally missed. Get the hell off me. Health? Pick up health? Like, I kinda wanna see what the death animation looks like. See if it was like a custom one just for this boar. Unless maybe it just knocks you over and you die. And that's it. It's over. Nowhere to run. It is so over for you. Where are you going? The boar kill was supposed to be anything but glorious. With the boar whimpering at the back of the gas station after Ellie's relentless hunt. After this, hearing the drone that we kind of come to associate with Ellie. Oops, I turned off an accident. And that was the hunt, the last one. Sorry, I cut off a little bit at the end there, but we pretty much get the deal what they're talking about. Um, all in all, they're pretty good. The sewers one, I kind of liked because you know sewers in video games could be um nicely placed when you're playing a game that's uh I guess a little bit more on the horror side. I wouldn't really call this game a horror game, but um for some people it could be because you know they could be afraid of just the infected people. They just got done fighting some or getting away from the stalkers, and so they get knocked down in the sewers, making them think, oh, there's probably like another thing down here that's going to attack me. So that's a bit like horrific to think about. The hunt, something interesting to play, I guess, after the, they said it was after the, uh, was it after this part? Or was it after the fight in general? What was the part with the party? Was the party... Flashback after the farm bit or was that before I'm trying to remember the timeline of these levels, but I Know the party happened a long time ago, but in the flashback when did that happen? It's like around the farm bit either before or during the farm bit. I don't remember, remember exactly But um, it was sometime around like the last two hours of the game That's gonna be it. Um, I, I like the last one part two. I really like it a lot Not as much as the first one, but it's not a bad game that's the one thing I want to just just straight off the bat just say it's not a bad game. I really like it a lot. Not as much as the first game, but they're both really good games in general. And I can't wait to see what happens when they make a part three eventually in like six or seven years. I'm not sure how long it takes. I hope it takes them a while because um, the more development time they have, the better it could be. And that's it. Bye.